Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. Got a really cool panel for you. Dave Pensado hosting Josh Goodwin, Dave Way, and Rafe Sardina. Brought to you by the Latin Alternative Music Conference. Um, it was held at the Gibson Center and sponsored by KRK. It's a great conversation about how to make hit records in general, how to make hit records for the Latin audience. We'll, we'll run that for you in just a second. But speaking of KRK, they got a very cool program coming on. Tease it right now. If you're a beat maker, get your beats ready. Around August 20th, you're going to be able to submit them. In September, the KRK Creator Classic is going to be launched, like a bracket, like college basketball or NBA basketball. And beats are going to be selected and judged all the way up. The winners get flown to Nashville to the Gibson Garage, and three superstar mentors are going to help turn that music into the next level. And you get to get all expense paid trip, hang out with some superstars, and make your music better. Stay tuned here. It's coming shortly. It's pretty cool. Thanks to Destin Bennett. Good idea, Destin. Um, please hit us up on all of our socials. We want to get back to you. Again, it's going to be a busy summer. We got a lot coming your way and we want to share it with you. And for now, enjoy this conversation. Dave Pensado, Josh Goodwin, Rafe Sardina, and Dave Way. Hey, it's, uh, it's good to be here with some of my friends. We got Rafa Sardina, one of my dear, dear friends, um, and then Dave Way, who I've known for 28 years. And this is Josh Goodwin, my, my newest friend and, and, and be rapidly becoming a great friend. These three guys, um, I've pretty much ripped off everything I can from them, and so I know a little bit of what they do. And these are three of the, the best human beings and th the most incredible mix engineers and, and in, in some of the cases producing too. So. You'll learn a lot. Josh, tell us, what, how do you usually start a mix? That, for me, that's... It depends if I have like a lot of mixes to do or if I have like a couple mixes to do. If I have a lot of mixes to do, I'm immediately just going for making sure my gain staging right, doing a quick balance, mm -hmm. and making sure that my drums and my bass are hitting correctly, mm -hmm. and then just work on the vocals. If like, if I listen to the song and I hear the vocals need a lot of work and the instrumental, the music section sounds great, I'll attack the vocals if I hear that the song and the, the music needs the most work and I know I can knock the vocals out quick, I'll mm -hmm. hit the, the music first. Mm -hmm. I'm not a very technical mixer and like I just mix it till it feels good to me and nothing's sticking out. Mm -hmm. Music is a universal thing. Like anybody from any language, like you could close your eyes and listen to music and feel great or you can yeah. listen to it and feel terrible. Yeah. So when mixing music, I just want it to make me feel great to the end. Rafa, what, um... What do you think are some of the components that would make a, a Grammy winning mix? I know that's a question that's unanswerable. Can you drop a gem on us or, or, or a process that you, that you uh, have felt kind of contributed to the uh, success? I think that um, for me, like Josh was saying, I mean, it's really spotting that emotion, right? And making, making it feel good, or even if you have to make it feel sad, but it has to be sad good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You have to really hit the the nerve, you know, the right spot for the music. And to me, uh, for me, just uh, taking advantage of opportunities, finding, okay, what could make this song even better than what I'm hearing right now in the rough mix, right? Well, how can I really make it, even, you know, catapult the, the mix into being something more emotional or even more original? Very often it's not about making even, not even making it sound good. It's not about that mm -hmm. either. It's about making it sound like really special, you know, it, and it could be just one element, you know, that yeah, just one yeah, yeah, single yeah, yeah. element. It could yeah. be even that, yeah. I don't know, like that kick bam, that hits every, I don't know, every two bars and it just makes the whole sound, you know. Yeah. Uh, when we were doing Genie in a Bottle, this is yeah, back, back yeah, in the day, yeah. these kids don't know. No, that's they don't know. Bottle, yeah. But, uh, no, but yeah. I remember, there, remember there's that kick drum that kind of goes, brrr, it's like a triplet I, kick I drum in there. Kick drum a and we kind of just yeah. decide that's one of those elements yeah. that we're like, let's just crank that up and see what mm. it sounds like. And when we did, I was yeah. like, that's great. Let's just, you know, so it's like mm. that special thing yeah. that kind of, yeah. you know, just pokes out more than maybe yeah. it should, but it really makes you take yeah. notice, you know? Mm -hmm. Dave, you picked a great example because um, part of what we're trying to do is, is relate to the audience that moment where you, actually contributed to something and uh, that was Christina Aguilera's first hit record and uh, uh, it altered my mind about the pop world 
Because mm -hmm. we, we were we were doing a lot of hip hop back then, and and yeah. and Dave killed that mix. I'm telling you, Josh, my friend. Yes, Dave. Um, this is the real deal right here. Some some people think, oh man, he made it so quickly. He made it so quickly because he's damn good. And 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 uh, watching him rise and everything, and and it's just been wonderful for me. And so share something with us that that you think um, gives you an advantage. Well, I think the main thing the main thing for me was I got involved with an artist and early on in his career and at the time you know we were cutting probably a couple hundred records a year and when it came down to actually finishing the albums we would send them off to mixers they would come back sounding differently and you know i'd rough mix every song to the best of my ability and after rough mixing a couple hundred songs you learn how to mix mm -hmm. and so it got to the point where the artist was just like why don't you just mix all the songs so i was like okay and so you know i got the direct cosign from the artist himself and then from there, it was just like, we had a successful album and then boom, that's it. Dave, how about you? Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I don't, I don't really have a template that I start from. I don't, uh, I, I basically just kind of go. I just start mm -hmm. <laughs> and whatever grabs my attention, uh, I, I just really just try and make it sound as good as I can, as quick as I can, and then step back from it in, half an hour an hour and kind of just then listen to it a little more critically and uh, because usually it's that first half an hour an hour that you're still kind of learning the song you've probably listened to the rough mix usually mm -hmm. listen to the rough mix mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. you know even getting into it but um so you know some songs you can kind of digest almost everything that's going on mm -hmm. in just one or two listens and so yeah. by the time you're into an hour you feel like you know what mm -hmm. everything's doing mm -hmm. and then there are some songs where you're discovering things that you didn't realize and there's layers of, of, of depth that weren't apparent when you first put it up and then you oh let me just spend a little more time on this this what the you know piano's doing here because i didn't realize it was doing this very cool counter line to what the vocal's doing and mm -hmm. th things like that but uh, so it's kind of a for me, just go and go on instinct and start uh, making it sound as, as good as I can, as quick as I can. And then at the same time, discovering really where the core of the song is. Sometimes you think the drum should be really slamming on something like that. But as you get into it, you realize, well, they don't have to be in it. And really, the power of the song is in the lyric. Let's make sure that the, the vocal mm -hmm. is the biggest thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, and it's never the same twice, honestly. I really try and let each song kind of dictate to me how mm -hmm. I'm gonna, you know, get into yeah. it. Senor, you. you. Yeah, I agree with, with both Joss and, and Dave. I mean, it, yeah, it's just finding, working super fast, super, super quick, finding, you know, your right balance so you don't think too much. Yeah. You are just reacting to what's happening and then you find, mm -hmm. you find that, very easily, you know, what's important, you know, yeah. as we mentioned, like that kick or that yeah. vocal line or that uh, guitar riff or something and, and you grab it and you make that like the backbone of everything else, even if it's not the most important yeah. element sonically speaking, yeah. but you make it like you leave the ro enough room for that yeah. element yeah. And, and obviously vocals are super important. So I yeah. always put vocals in the mix like yeah. super early on right. yeah. and I even work all of the effects even without finishing the rest of the instrumental, I work all of my effects and delays and this. And so sometimes it sounds even a little bit weird because it's a very unfinished, <laughs> it's a very unbalanced product in terms yeah. of what the instrumental is saying versus the vocals. But I start imagining how that's gonna fit the rest of the song and mm -hmm. then I work the rest of the elements. Well, I'm a little different. It. What I do is I look for that one sound, that amazing sound that I can use my new $300 plug-in on. <laughs> <laughs> And and, and and then after we get that established, um, I try to, my best to not solo, and so I, I try to find that sound that I can build the like basically basically the reverse of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I I, I I I I'm a combination of all you guys because I, I listen to the rough a lot. I, I talk to the to the producer or the artist, try and figure out what they want, and then. And then sometimes I'm not an enhance the mix kind of mixer, so I have to I have to test my clients for how much latitude I've got in changing everything in the song. Yeah. I love movement. I love when when Post Malone has a vibrato at the end of a long note. Uh, I, I love movement, and um, 
if I go, hi, how are you? Or if I go, hi, how are you? There's a different level of energy in both those things. So, so in, in the terms of mixing, you don't want to be monotonous. You want to move things around. And, 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 and I don't try to hear everything in the mix. I try to let you hear the most important thing in the mix. And then I move the, the, the other things around and we swap sometimes and things like that. So in my world, one of the most powerful tools is that, is that fader. And I think it's underutilized. And um, instead of reaching for a compressor first, reach for a fader and see what happens, you know? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It might have been one of you guys, but uh, I've started um, making an effort to print my mix at, at various stages. So in the course of four or five hours, I might print two or three different versions. Definitely the version before I left mm -hmm. that night, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, I don't know about you guys, but that's really helped me a lot because it's not unusual, particularly lately in the quarantine era, uh, for me to fall in love with my, my 30th mix and I listened to my original right. mix and uh, it was way, way better. And boy, is that disappointing. <laughs> I, pick, I do that a lot. I print a lot too, you know, because sometimes you, you have that gut feeling, oh, this is good, but then you come back to it and you start like polishing, polishing, right. like doing things, things. And then it becomes like even too polished or I don't know, you start like getting rid of the edges of the mix, right? right. And you need, sometimes you need edges, you need rough edges in the mix. You need yeah. things that yeah. are gonna really stick out and... Yeah. It so only yeah, takes right? one instrument yeah. to really throw, like you yeah. can have a balance and all of a sudden you, you start playing around with the bass sound and all of a sudden you make it too important and it's sticking out, you know, it kind of yeah, throws off the yeah, balance of yeah. the whole track. Just, yeah. you start obsessing over a part. And I, I usually go through a point in the mix, usually it's towards the end, where I'm, I, I just want to make sure the bass is popping through on like small speakers and, you know, phones and stuff, mm -hmm. because that's always a, a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's usually a spot where I'll just start really zeroing in on the bass, particularly whatever mid-range frequency I'm trying to find that's gonna mm -hmm. make it pop out. But when you're doing that, you're also, um, you know, messing around with the balance of the bass and the drums and the, and the vocal, right? And that's kind of a crucial foundation to the song for, for most pop songs. And, you know, you can just turn up the bass a little too much and it starts to mess up the groove, you know? But mm -hmm. you were just thinking of it in terms of sonics rather than feel for a little while. And so that's what I like about doing it quickly is that I'm just thinking about feel, not getting too obsessed about the sonics of things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when, the more you work on it, the more you obsess on the sonic things and you start to lose the feel a bit, you know? Yeah. So, but I, I love what you said about printing mixes as you go along. I've been doing that for a long time. I think I, I got that from you. Oh, well, I got it from Bruce Swedeen. When we first got Dats, that's when I was like, oh, this is, and I, I'm just gonna print everything all day. Like every time I think it sounds good, let's just print a mix to be able to go back and listen to when three days later, <laughs> you're listening and it's like, why doesn't it sound as, it doesn't make me feel as good as it did, you know, two days ago. Let's mm -hmm. listen to that and see what the difference is. And in, you know, working in Pro Tools now, and especially if you're in the box yeah. completely, that's one of the greatest things to be able to, to take advantage of, you know? Josh, rather than, than ask you the same question, um, your process, um, I'm fascinated by your process. You don't have to describe in detail, but just your philosophy behind what you're trying to get in different parts of the process, you know? I honestly don't know how my process differs from anybody else because I don't know how anybody else really does it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm in a service industry, mixing is a service industry. If I'm if I'm solely only thinking about mixing, I'm I'm only trying to mix it till it gets me high and makes me feel good. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. that's my process. Mm -hmm. And as far as like the numbering system and mixing, I label my mixes as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I send them a folder of all those as time goes by. And certain clients like to go back to O3 vocals and the instrumental from O5. So I just import the vocals and, right. and import that and then just rebalance real quick. Can you describe how you may manage to print all those stems? I think it's pretty fascinating the way you do that because you're yeah. always in, able to print stems. Yeah, I used to I used to just export like uh, through sends out of my master auxes, and they would all just go and print to like tracks like now or like uh, just um, underneath my session. But now I just have like my assistant Heidi print stems all fucking night. If I'm doing Bieber stuff like 
they need vocals dry, they need this dry, they need this separated and that separated. So it's kind of a, it's a la carte, if you will. What's the status of mastering now? Is it still useful? Is it more useful than ever? Uh, is it a good way to have a safety net to see if you're doing fits in with what is necessary? Tell, tell me what you're... I think it's about your relationship with the master engineer. I mean, it really comes down to that. It, does he really understand what you're doing? How far you're going with the low end in specific mixes? And is he going to respect that? Mm -hmm. um, because you have to be in sync with the guy who's going to be mastering it. Uh, and sometimes you expect more, sometimes you expect less. You don't want them to do much at all. Mm -hmm. And they have to be honest enough to to come back to you and say like, oh, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to do much. I'm just going to maybe make it a tiny bit louder or maybe even not. So I think that we're, these days we're mixing like pretty close to, um, to a master product in a way because mm -hmm. we're being compared to that constantly. That, that, that's, uh, that's the new, that's where we're at right now. We're being mm -hmm. constantly compared to the, yeah. Uh, and already master, we have always been, but now more than ever, they expect to immediately, immediate gratification, here like the, something close, close, close to the final product. Mm -hmm. So in a way we are so like pre-mastering, even without really asking for the job description. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we have been forced to become that too. So many times uh, there isn't much more they can do in mastering, so it becomes like a safety net. Yeah. And obviously they have to uh, make the different songs, you know, fit together in a way if this, if it's going to be part of a body of work. But no, if, not even that is that important anymore, you know, yeah. with, with yeah. the streaming. So, yeah, it's, it's funny because the, the role of what a mastering engineer does has changed so drastically, you know, 50 years or so, you know, okay, mm -hmm. really kind of started as a, a, a a, a product of having to cut vinyl and having to deal, mm -hmm. you know, that, yeah. that in itself is a, is a, is an art form and, and, and takes a lot of skill to be able to fit as much of the music on a very limited, uh, physical, mm -hmm. uh, dynamic. Yeah. So, so you, you, you know, that's what a mastering engineer was really skilled at doing. And I think most engineers probably then were very happy to put, put it in the hands of somebody with those skills. Then, you know, when CDs came out, uh, we didn't have to worry about cutting for vinyl so much, but um, now it was still part of the process. It was, you know, uh, kind of ingrained in how we did things, but also the mastering engineers had some very specific equipment, 1630s, and, and, and mm -hmm. it was a very specialized uh, process still that you needed to go to mastering for, for, for this reason. Uh, but now, as, you know, as soon as being able to burn CDs on your computer came out, then there's really, um, in my mind, the only reason you're going to a mastering engineer is for their take on what you're doing, for the relationship mm -hmm. that you have with a, a, mm -hmm. any particular mastering engineer. And, you know, they, this is something that they do every day uh, they're listening to all kinds of music, all, you know, uh, many more th things, many more projects than we get to listen to and, mm -hmm. you know, we'll work on in one year. If we're mixing an album that, you know, takes, you know, a month, two months or whatever. Um, but in those two months, they've mastered 200 songs, you know, by all mm -hmm. different styles. So um, in this day and age, you know, uh, there's really no reason why any of us can't give the client a, a f loud, fully mastered sounding wave file, right? That they could just use I as a master. So. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I think most of us here really want that safety net of saying, well, you yeah. know, yeah. I, 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 and, I need it, I make so, a yeah. lot of mistakes. Yeah. 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 Let, me, uh, let me chime in on this real quick, because it's important. Um, mastering, like, I just got done with a new Bieber album just now, and I'm 25 songs in, and I lose perspective of like, at like two weeks ago, I'm like, yo, these mix are fire. This shit's fucking crazy. And then like four days to turning it in, I'm like, I don't even know what this sounds that's like when, that's anymore. That's when the panic starts. To yeah, so it's yeah. like, I'm calling my guy. I was like, dude, I need you to freaking QC the heck out of this thing. Like right. call me out if something's missing because I'm so deep in the vortex. I don't know what sounds good anymore. I'm just going off of instinct. And then that aside, the label needs all these deliverables. They need all these versions. They need cleans. They need uh, 
master iTunes, all these different versions. If I had to physically do all that work, I would go crazy. Like I don't even, I don't, I don't want to deliver anything. I'm delivering my mixes, getting them approved, and the mastering engineer has to deliver tons of crap to the label. So that's still important. I still think mastering is going to be the first automated, uh, complete automated thing in our career. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Because they're mixing a two track. Yeah. They're mastering a two track. You could do that yeah. with analyzers, kind of. Yeah. It's still it's a tasteful happening. thing. It's yeah. already happening. Yeah. 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 Like, so I'm, I'm like, I need it at the same time. I'm afraid for mastering engineers. <laughs> and then minus the five percenters. Yeah. That mix that we feel we're too good to do, just that everything sounds horrible and nothing sounds good, and then you play it and you're like, damn, I kind of like that. That's kind of cool. What one technique or piece of information would you share with the bedroom indie guy that's going to elevate him? You know, for the bedroom guys, like just when they're creating their music and they're dialing in their sounds and getting creative with EQ and compression and feeling, like that's the most important thing for those guys because they're gonna learn how to do it on their own. Mm-hmm. And when it's time to graduate from that or evolve into something different, they're already gonna have the skill sets to mix, right? Yeah. So I think learning how to dial in your own sounds and doing it yourself and cutting out the middleman mm-hmm. um, is extremely important for cats like that. Well put. The younger generation is really great at sounds and getting, you know, just amazing mm-hmm. sonics mm-hmm. on things. It, and that's like so awesome <laughs> because it makes our jobs easier. But um, I, I, I would, if I was gonna give advice to anybody, it's, it's don't forget about the song and make the song as bulletproof as possible, mm-hmm. you know, is arrangement wise and, and uh, uh, you know, just getting the song as tight as possible because that's like, there's a whole editing process that goes on just to make sure the song is as good as it can be, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know songwriters who spend, you know, constantly obsessing over it should be, it, whether it should be we or me or, it, you know, is or was or, you know, these mm-hmm. little words mm-hmm. that make a difference. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say this. When you produce a song, it could take a year, it could take two years. When you write a song, sometimes that song is not going to get placed for years. You know, it could be five years later. When you mix a song, it's like a mirror, right? You give to the song and then you give it, it gives back to you and you're instantly well, fulfilled, yeah, you're instantly well high. Yeah. And it's like, it's like mm-hmm. every mix I do, it's like a runner's high. Like I can create the mix and it like gives me back my energy that I just put into yeah. it. When I'm producing a vocal, That's I incredible. give all my, vo- my, my energy to the artist, they take it and then they leave me with nothing. And then I have to work the song, build the song, rough mix song, fix the song. But when I get my energy, energy into a mix, it's reciprocated instantly. Mm-hmm. That's why I fucking love mixing so much. No, I totally That's agree. Great, right? I, totally I, totally agree. Agree. I mean, you too. describe it very, very yeah. well. Yeah. Like the way it well, makes you bro, feel. When you yeah. produce the vocal, it's like, yeah. Nah. yeah. And then they're like, oh, <laughs> the more love you put into it, the more love you're going to get. Yeah. yeah. So, Listen, That's guys, uh, when I found out I was going to uh, be hanging out with you guys, I was so happy. And um, I've learned a lot. And you guys have been an inspiration uh, for me for quite a long time. Uh, even Josh. Um, I learned a lot from Josh. Uh, uh, Dave is one of my mentors in kind of a weird way because we, sh- we shared a studio. He was in one side of the studio and I was in the other a studio called Larrabee. And uh, Rafa, you know. No, I have to say just the amigo. opposite. You have been our inspiration. Yeah. I have to say you have been Bro, our you changed the game, dude. for the longest time. You what, changed the whole what game. What are you talking about? Oh, shucks. <laughs> no, you have. I mean, it's like... Damn it. No, it's true, Dave. It's really well, true. I, I, I will say this. Maybe we can end with this. This might be a good way to end. I, I am the composition of a lot of different people. Uh, starting 45 years ago, I was blessed to have some of the greats see something in me I couldn't see for myself. And um, I'll, never, I'll never forget them, and I'll never stop talking about them. Um, you hear me talk about Ed C., Paul Davis, Rodney uh, Mills, um, these people uh, uh, were early instrumental uh, influences on my on, on my work um, in my life. I have so much respect for these three guys, and and they they've all been a contributor to my success out here in Los Angeles. Don't go it alone, and uh, have some good comments or don't have anything at all to say. But we'll see you soon. <laughs>